What happened to those Africans in Guangzhou, a metropolis in southern China? Well, that has aroused a, a lot of attention from African leaders as well as Chinese officials. Well, Guangzhou authorities have adopted measures to protect people from the threat of COVID-19 from imported cases. As both sides set up mechanism to address the issue, what is the latest on those Africans, especially Nigerians in Guangzhou? And what can the local government learn to better communicate with non-Chinese and what shall be done to strengthen China-Africa cooperation since African countries are increasingly threatened by COVID-19. To talk about these issues and more, I'm joined by satellite by Omar Khan, our reporter in Guangzhou, and our Tangan, an independent current affairs commentator by Skype, by Dr. Osidipe Atankora, a researcher at the Institute of African Studies at Zhejiang Normal University, and He Wenping, a senior research fellow at Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. That is our topic. This is Dialogue. I'm Zhou Yue. Uh, let me start with you, uh, Omar. Uh, just a few days ago, uh, there were some videos on social media showing that some Africans in Guangzhou are treated badly amid the investigation on COVID-19 and quarantine. Well, some people say this is a misunderstanding, and uh, in a joint press conference by the Nigerian Foreign Minister and the Chinese Ambassador, uh, the Nigerian Foreign Minister said that some Nigerians actually did not follow quarantine regulations. So, uh, what exactly has happened? Yeah, so, so yeah, I think we can look at this in uh, sort of two parts, two phases. Uh, you mentioned those uh, images, those videos would surface on social media. Uh, and there was, a, there was a reaction to that, uh, as one would expect, uh, at uh, seeing videos of, of people uh, potentially and, and most likely being evicted, people in the streets, uh, particularly from this one community, from the African community in Guangzhou, uh, specifically in Yueshou district. Uh, but the current situation, uh, what, what's the latest, what is in Guangzhou, uh, it seems that uh, authorities have changed their approach uh, to dealing uh, and to implementing these sort of uh, control and preventative measures in response to COVID-19. There's a lot more details uh, about this community, specifically in Yuesho District. Uh, but going back, reflecting on that, I think uh, th I, could, I could mention one meeting that took place this morning and in the past few days. Uh, there have been multiple uh, press conferences. Uh, even Zhou Nanshan this morning, he met uh, with a handful of, uh, of international residents uh, primarily African students residing here in Guangzhou. Uh, I think that was to send a message that uh, from a medical standpoint, uh, when it comes to testing, when it comes to uh, contact tracing, or it comes to just handling the situation, he, he spoke purely from a, a medical perspective that uh, testing needs to be done uh, uh, since March 28th, there, there haven't been foreigners coming mm -hmm. into the and country. And Zhongnan Shan being uh, China is uh, one of the top could, uh, uh, could, uh, respiratory disease to experts. Yeah, absolutely. I think he's well respected, not only in China, but in the international community. He's kind of uh, been the face of, 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 of leading uh, the battle against COVID-19. Uh, we, we heard from some of the, the students and some of the uh, foreign population in Guangzhou who attended that meeting. I even know people who wanted to get invited and who wanted to be there. Uh, he's uh, held in a high regard. And the feedback from these uh, what are seemingly new mechanisms uh, to communicate, to, to kind of uh, contact these uh, the people who have been affected. Uh, it is helping. Uh, people are uh, responding uh, in a good way to it. There, there was a sense of appreciation. Uh, but I think there's uh, more should be done and more can always be done uh, to, to avoid situations what we saw uh, earlier last week. Uh, but let's talk about what actually happened before. In early April investigation, uh, five imported cases of Nigerians, uh, nationals, they were confirmed, and they found that four of the five confirmed uh, had eaten at a local uh, restaurant in Yueshou District, as you mentioned, and that caused some local community-based transmission. That, that is actually what started off an investigation uh, on the people coming from Africa, right?
Yeah, that's, that's what it does seem like. It do, you mentioned that it was a rather small group, and I think that's why uh, the response, what we saw last week, uh, garnered such a uh, backlash, such a negative reaction uh, on social media. Uh, a lot of people were, were calling it, uh, it was a form of st uh, discrimination or st stigmatization. Uh, but I think there's definitely more to that, as, we, as you had mentioned there uh, from the foreign ministry uh, in Nigeria, uh, discussing that uh, this more or less, uh, in some way, it's only one part of, of this situation, that uh, miscommunication at a local level uh, undoubtedly happened. Uh, there's there's going to be a, a requirement or a greater need uh, if these situations are going to be handled moving forward. Why are people being quarantined? Uh, a lot of I spoke to uh, one Ugandan, one South African, and uh, their their response was, "We just want to know why. Uh, we want to be given explanations uh, and reasons uh, for what <clears throat> for excuse me for what is happening." So I think approaching it uh, in that way. Uh, is, is a lot better uh, than arbitrarily moving into these areas uh, and having situations like we, like we saw earlier in the last week. Um, so definitely greater communication, uh, a, a greater uh, channel for communication, especially with community leaders uh, in, in Yesho District, in Guangzhou altogether. Uh, I think that's what most people have been uh, calling for and they want as a, a sort of response to, to what happened. Um, and there, of course there's been discussions you look online on social media, people are saying, okay, is it the landlords? Is it the way local authorities handled this situation? Was there perhaps pushback or resistance uh, from some of the, the foreign nationals who uh, potentially could have not wanted to, to be left to be exposed to, to having perhaps an illegal migrant status? You think of the, the Sui Kang, the sort of QR code system in China. Everyone has to essentially use it. You can't go into any building, uh, be it foreigner, be it uh, Chinese national. Mm. I use it everywhere I go. Yeah. Uh, it's just part of uh, the very good system China has put in. Um, so perhaps there's, there's more uh, to be discussed in that regard. So, so the, the key is, is Omar, uh, whether these policies, uh, testing or quarantine policies applied uh, uh, that is nationality blind, that is applying to everybody. Uh, does everybody in Guangzhou understand this? Oh, well, I, does everyone understand it? Of course, that would be the hope that everyone understands it. I know Canadians who are currently in quarantine. I know uh, an individual from New Zealand. I know people from South Africa. I know uh, people from Sub-Saharan Africa. I know people from all over. Uh, I think there's nothing wrong uh, with being placed in quarantine as long as it's communicated properly and there's reasoning provided. Uh, I can use one example. Uh, the one South African individual I spoke with, uh, their experience was, all right, I was told uh, I had come, uh, this individual had come back to China uh, in early March. They were asked, okay, you would, you're, you're going to have to quarantine. Uh, they described it as a very uh, transparent, positive experience. They were treated with respect. Uh, and they were able to clear their quarantine and they were able to, uh, to go on with their life in Guangzhou. And I think if we could take that, mm. uh, that model of, of being able to communicate uh, reasoning and why something is happening, then you will undoubtedly avoid situations which have, which have resulted in what we saw last week. All right. And obviously the treatment of the Africans in Guangzhou has attracted uh, some traffic on the Internet, both in China and Africa. Local authorities said they are improving uh, their working methods. Here's, uh, I quote, uh, the measures include to provide health management services without differentiation, designate hotels for the accommodation of foreigners for observation, and adopt price adjustment for those in financial difficulties to set up effective communication mechanism with foreign consulates generals in Guangzhou and reject all racist and discriminatory remarks. So, uh, has the handling by the local authorities and, and the enforcement been improved since this uh, notice being put up there, Omar? Uh, well, yeah, it, it's been, a, I would say, roughly a week. I can't really pinpoint the date, but since uh, those, uh, especially on social media, those uh, videos and reports began to emerge, uh, I think the response, uh, at least in Guangzhou and, and from Beijing, and uh, at a diplomatic level, uh, a response ha there was, it had to be made. People had to address this. This wasn't something that uh, was just going to go away. 
I think the example, like I mentioned earlier, uh, today what we saw, uh, an open sort of roundtable discussion with China's top uh, medical uh, respiratory expert, Zhong Yanshan Anna, I think that, that's one gesture, that, that's one uh, sort, of, uh, sort of, I guess, move you could call it, uh, to, to give a bit of uh, openness, to be able to address some concerns. I know a lot of the people at that uh, event, my colleagues were there, I wasn't there unfortunately, but mm. uh, from what I've seen, from what I've heard, they were able to address their concerns uh, towards the situation. As for, as for other mechanisms, I can only say since uh, I've, been, I've been in Guangzhou since uh, COVID-19 and at the time coronavirus, the outbreak, uh, outbreak started. Uh, we had covered some foreign nationals who were treated uh, in hospitals, be it in Shenzhen uh, or in Guangzhou. Uh, and I, that, that hasn't stopped. If, mm. if someone is ill, uh, they will be treated. Uh, from my understanding, Guangzhou will be setting up uh, free testing locations. Uh, people can go there, people can get tested. Uh, and I, I believe the, the same measures remain. Everyone uh, should be, everyone is still wearing a mask, everyone is still uh, taking all uh, necessary precautions. And the hopes are that uh, the foreign uh, expat community, the foreign nationals uh, in, in the city do get more communication and do get more explanation. I can give one example. Uh, in Shenzhen, uh, the local authorities there have used videos. They've, they've tried to, uh, you know, on social media platforms, tell uh, local residents that uh, we should be treating people with respect and, and encouraging people to see everyone in the, in the same light. So I think there are definitely ways uh, to approach this. Mm. Uh, it, it's just unfortunate what happened, but it, it, has been, uh, it has been good to see that there has been a response uh, from both uh, African leaders, Nigerian uh, diplomats, uh, and of course the Chinese side. And, and Dr. Adunkule, in the case of those Africans' uh, treatment in Guangzhou, uh, the Nigerians especially, uh, what, what are your thoughts on what happened? Um, actually, what I uh, say there is this, the situation was quite uh, disturbing, uh, but if we look at it from a, uh, a different perspective, uh, taking into view what has been happening in China right before uh, the incident happened, everyone that uh, understand what China went through when the virus broke out will be able to understand uh, what happened in Guangzhou. Uh, if we look at it very well, the way I saw it is this. I don't live in Guangzhou quite a well, bit. From the way I look at it is this. There's a picture of two people. One is trying to uh, stay alive mm. and not be affected by the virus. The second group is trying to have respect and be respected. Now, the two sides, are also, they are having the same need. They, also, they both need to be alive. They both need to be respected. But what is missing in between them, just like uh, we've seen, is that there is no proper communication. There is a misunderstanding, which is based on the lack of proper communication. These people, uh, the Chinese, the Africans, they've been living together in Guangzhou for quite a long time. Mm. And normally we've been having interactions. We have friends are also having issues. They can have misunderstanding between them. But at this time, I think what really happened, what led to this problem was lack of communication, proper communication. In this time that we are in, everyone is on edge. It's a time of emergency. Yeah. China was like in a state of war for some time now. And we know that everywhere, everybody wants to stay alive. So it is not a surprise seeing what happened. Yeah. But we shouldn't use what has happened uh, to create, uh, you know, enmity, to create strife, to create anger. Just, you know, the way we have seen it online being spread and as if China and Nigeria or China doesn't like African or Africans don't like Chinese. It, that is not what is happening. There is a problem of lack of communication which led to misunderstanding. I, I think and what you mentioned is important communication because mm. uh, there are yes. always misunderstandings between law enforcement and those who are living yes. in restrictive uh, measures. Not, not only uh, yes. those foreigners but also some Chinese uh, have uh, yes. some misunderstandings, probably even more so for, for Nigerians or other African nationals living in China. Yes, you're right, you're right. Because for, as a foreigner, what, what I discover is as foreigners, 
uh, they don't speak Chinese language, they don't understand. And if I walk to the hospital and I see somebody trying to tell me to move into the hospital and I don't understand what you're saying, there is the tendency for them to be anxious and to be afraid. They are scared. What is happening? What do you want to do? So if there is no one to actually communicate to them, oh, this is what we want to do with preparing the mind of these people to understand what they are going to go through. I think this is the area where we need to really address very well mm. to ensure that we don't have a reoccurrence of what is happening. It's good that we can see leaders on both sides trying to uh, you know, uh, resolve the situation, but it cannot stop there. The, main, the most important thing is for us to work towards proper communication, engagement with the people all the time. Let there be engagement between both sides so that we can understand each other better. And Anar, uh, the bigger context of this is China is facing a huge challenging text to prevent imported cases uh, and also domestic resurgence of COVID-19. And how difficult is it now for China to stem uh, the further spread of this disease after the initial success of containing it uh, over the first three months? Well, I mean, obviously China has moved to monitor its borders very, very carefully. It's uh, closing them in many instances. We've seen on the Russian border up near Heilongjiang uh, many, many cases, uh, shockingly, uh, no, you know, 50, 40 uh, from different uh, groups of Chinese who've traveled to Russia. It doesn't spell very good. Uh, obviously, this vigilance is every border. Uh, Guangzhou is a busy, bustling uh, town. Uh, it's uh, a port town. People are coming in and out. Goods are moving in and out. It is on lockdown. But, you know, there, there is, there's no excuse for uh, racism. Mm. And if there's ham-handed um, tactics by local officials or police, they need to be investigated. But please, don't mistake this as the actions of the Chinese government, because it isn't. Uh, quite frankly, China has $300 billion since 2005 to 2018 invested in Africa in uh, this kind of infrastructure growth program. It's a long-term program. Obviously, they're dedicated to it. They're handling the situation as it has arisen. But, you know, there are always going to be mistakes. And, you know, quite frankly, you know, a picture is worth a thousand words, but it doesn't necessarily give you the context. So people should be a little bit careful about rushing to judgment. What happened to those people, if that was in fact the case, was wrong. It needs to be investigated. But this should not serve as a generalization for all attitudes of Chinese towards foreigners. Well, well, well it's interesting you said that picture speaks louder than a thousand words. Uh, Dr. Eden Kude, uh, actually people are exchanging uh, information very rapidly, sometimes maybe quicker than they even are ready for, especially on social media like Twitter and Facebook. What do you make of social media's role in probably fanning some animosity and distrust uh, among the peoples? Uh, this time, of course, is uh, between Chinese and Nigerians. Okay, yes. Actually, uh, we have seen uh, a new dimension of what the social media can do, especially in people-to-people -people, uh, interactions globally, especially at this time where, where the whole world is experiencing uh, uh, a kind of uh, attack from an unknown virus, you know. Uh, what we have seen so far is that the social media, uh, could have, which could have served as a very good platform of, uh, you know, reaching out to people to, uh, uh, to encourage them to, you know, to strengthen them to be able to face this challenge, it has turned out to be a platform for misinformation. A lot of people have used the, uh, the platform of this uh, social media to spread, you know, untruths and things that will really create a lot of uh, negative uh, uh, emotions all over the world. Fear are created in people. You see people, all, they, cannot even, they don't even want to move out of their houses based on the information they receive on the social media. And that is why even now we, what we're looking at is that uh, the platform, the, the promoters of social media platforms like Twitter, like Facebook, you know, Facebook has done it well, very well anyway. Most of them turn people back uh -huh. to the World Health Organization for information. So we, I think there should be more censorship on social media, mm. no matter what. Well, that's um, a big one if, because yeah, maybe and, they want to take yeah, up social, that job. Yeah. So they may not want to do it, but at the same time, individuals, we should be able to be gatekeepers by ourselves. If I receive an information online, I have to be a gatekeeper to process this information. Is it true? 
where is it coming from? Can I verify the information? Mm. I have to double check before I proceed to send it to other people. Like what the uh, what, what woman said is that pictures speak more than words. I can see picture, but uh, from the picture, I have to uh, have to make up a lot of conclusions. But before I make the conclusion, have I verified? the information the picture is trying to show me. So this is what we can do as individuals to censor what we receive, to be gatekeepers of information we receive on the social media. We cannot stop the social media from working, we cannot censor them, but we can censor what we receive and what we send out. And so living, as to avoid living things like and this. working in China, uh, in particularly uh, in Zhejiang province, uh, how do you feel uh, the social management skills and levels I in your place? And what do you want to say to those law enforcement in Guangzhou? Uh, here in Georgian province, well, I think it's um, the foreign nationals here uh, are also many. We have a, quite a lot of them here in Georgian province. We, we have, because I, I work in a university, we have platforms for foreigners uh, where we can interact and also discuss. But there is ease still this gap between you know foreign nationals and the locals will there's this an area where there's need for the government to encourage you know uh, kind of uh, people to people you know uh, interactions what i discovered recently is that despite the fact that china and africa has been you know interacting for many years at the official level we have very strong and robust relationship the people of China and the people of Africa know very little about each other because of lack of consistent and effective you know, interaction between them. So we need to go further and see how do we strengthen this. We need to promote people-to-people -people exchanges so that Chinese people uh, can know more about the Africans. I know about Chinese because I, I have the opportunity to mm. come here and I can see them. I live between, with them. So I understand better. Now, we should pro also provide this opportunity for more Africans and Chinese to yeah. get to know more about each other. That All way, right. we can prevent Thank this. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. And, and Omar, you. do you think uh, the law enforcement personnel and the community workers in Guangzhou probably can see this as a chance to visit some of the policies and carry out their work uh, with nuance uh, in, in the future? Well, I would definitely hope so that that's the case. I was speaking uh, to several colleagues and to, uh, to several other locals, and, and they were kind of describing it as that sometimes when a, a certain uh, action or policy comes from the top and is unimplemented, it's just simply implemented. It, there's no really thought or, or process that takes place. Uh, and, and I think back to what we saw last week of, of people being evicted and on the streets, and I, and I, I really thought about this. I spoke with people, and, so, and, and we kind of came to the conclusion was, what if there was communication in that situation? Let's say uh, from the provincial level with consulates, they had a discussion, we're having this issue, we're having people not being able, we're not able to test certain uh, group of people, uh, perhaps they're meeting resistance, or they're not be able, being able to communicate with them, let's approach this hand in hand, in tandem. Uh, imagine if that was the approach, I think we most likely wouldn't have had this issue. Uh, we most likely wouldn't have seen what we saw last week. And this would have been able mm. to, to be dealt in a much better way. And, and that kind of makes me, uh, makes me think of other parts of China where those mechanisms do exist, where, where people are, do get communication, are, are, are given in, uh, an opportunity to speak or a contact person. I, I can speak firsthand. I know uh, a group of, uh, of foreign expats uh, here in Guangzhou who, who did uh, find themselves not being able to enter a gym because of a landlord. They were able to, to contact local authorities. That was sorted. Uh, so if people are aware of, mm. of these mechanisms, of these channels to turn to, I, I don't think yeah. what we, we saw last week would have taken place. Uh, but again, it, it is a two-side uh, approach to solving these things, and, and people need to be aware of this uh, from both an authority side and from a resident side. Okay, and we have uh, Ms. Ho Enping on the line. She is a, a research fellow from the Chinese Academy of Social Sciences. And, and you've been traveling uh, all over Africa, so you understand how important is it for both sides to understand uh, each other's stance and, and also the impact of media in Africa. What mm -hmm. are your suggestions for Guangzhou and maybe other tiny cities to handle similar issues? 
Yeah, of course. Uh, just like uh, my African colleague just mentioned, uh, this uh, mutually communication and understand each other, I think, uh, should play the crucial role. Uh, actually, as to this specific case uh, in Guangdong, uh, in Guangzhou city as well, I think uh, maybe it's uh, due to lack of this uh, comprehensive communication. And those uh, African based there, maybe they haven't aware of uh, this importance of uh, you know, curbing these uh, imported cases. Uh, actually, now local officials, they have been under a very heavy burden uh, to control and curb uh, these imported cases because these matters are for the safety of all of the people, including African, including other countries' nationality, of course, uh, including all the local mm. people there. So this kind of information sharing, sometimes I heard uh, maybe those uh, notice hasn't been written in English, uh, just in Chinese, uh, so local people aware of uh, comprehensively, and by the foreigners, uh, they haven't uh, aware of uh, in that kind of a thorough way. But, but so the stories a, of a those Nigerians being the, treated uh, mm -hmm. that way has been, uh, has been seen and read by people in Africa. And you have been traveling there, a lot of friends from Africa. What, what do you want to say to your friends there? Yeah, uh, the message I want to deliver is uh, no matter Chinese in Africa or Africans in China, I think uh, uh, first of all you have to fully abide by the local law and the relevant regulations. Uh, not even in the daily, those routine time, especially in this very special time, uh, like this uh, antivirus time. So you have to fully follow the situation, follow what's going on uh, in the city you are based in and uh, abide by the, the regulation. So don't think uh, you are even above uh, the local uh, national treatment or you are below. Mm. I don't think there is anything like above or the below. Uh, you have been treated equally. Uh, so you, you are being there, you stay there, you have to you know, follow the mainstream as well. So this is the message I want to deliver, either to those Chinese in Africa, yeah, because before we also have those kind of suffering, a bad story, uh, like some Chinese uh, dig those uh, gold in the Ghana. Uh, it also has been taken into the local police uh, because they haven't heard uh, mm. those uh, new regulations given by the Ghanaian uh, government, saying that now the gold uh, digging is no longer uh, tolerable. Before, it's a green area, so they have been there. Okay. So this is the same uh, mistake okay. they have been uh, done. NR, uh, of course, Africa uh, hasn't seen many cases, but still, many people say it's a huge challenge for Africa to deal with COVID-19, and China could be a helping hand there. Uh, absolutely. I mean, the reason you don't hear about many cases is there aren't any uh, real testing that's going on. It's uh, very improbable, uh, given the spread and where it's gone to, that Africa will be spared. There's a tremendous amount of, of travel, remember, between um, uh, England, France, Africa, not only China, uh, those are hotbeds also where there could probably has been spread, uh, especially with these uh, kind of uh, uh, less robust medical infrastructure, it's going to be an issue. And I, I think China will rise to the situation and provide what it can in terms of uh, aid, not only in materials, but perhaps even doctors. And, and this is going to be the true test of friendship when somebody okay. is down. All right. And actually, we are all in this together. Thank you very much, Enar. Thank you, Omar. And thank you, Ms. He. You've been watching Dialogue here on CGTN. I'm Joey. Thank you so much for watching. Goodbye.